When was the last time you were lost? Maybe you're in an unfamiliar city and you miss your exit, and suddenly you're just not sure where you are. I don't know about you, but when that happens, I'm sure glad I have an amazing piece of technology in my pocket, a smartphone with GPS. Our global positioning system is so good these days that even most areas of wilderness have coverage. But imagine for a minute that you were way, way out in the middle of nowhere, say, 148 million miles from the nearest cell tower, like on the surface of Mars. What if you could get turn by crater navigation on the red planet? Being able to navigate on Mars is, in real time is an important precondition of human exploration of our nearest planetary neighbor. But before we get to that, it's helpful to know how our own planet's navigation system was developed and deployed. The global positioning system was proposed by the military to monitor the locations and movements of troops, aircraft, ground vehicles, and ships. Long ago, sailors and explorers would navigate using the stars and constellations in the night sky. But just over 40 years ago, a man-made constellation of sorts was launched and changed everything about the way we move around our planet. It wasn't long before the general public took notice and demanded the same kind of accuracy and reliability as the military. This led to handheld GPS receivers like Garmin's and TomTom's, then cars with navigation systems, and now GPS receivers are in our smartphones and in many other devices. You can order food, packages, a ride share, groceries, and track their movement in real time as they make their way to your house. The U.S. system consists of many ground stations and 24 satellites in four orbital planes in medium Earth orbit at an altitude of about 12,500 miles, beaming radio signals to receivers on the ground that parse the data. The European system, Galileo, is similar with another two dozen satellites in three orbital planes. Other countries have deployed their own systems as well, which then provide global coverage for billions of users. The number of satellites in different orientations allow us to triangulate our position on the planet. This requires line of sight to at least three or more satellites, which is why the array requires the global constellation we currently have in place. These systems also rely on clocks, really, really good ones. Our satellites are zipping around the planet at about 9,000 miles per hour, which is fast enough that onboard time will appear to slow relative to the receivers on Earth. The satellites have to account for this and know very accurately where they are in both space and time to the nearest nanosecond, which is one billionth of a second. Advances in this technology allow the receiver to be accurate to the nearest meter or even less. So all of this, as you can probably guess, is really fun stuff for me engineers like me to study and improve upon. Sure, it's a little nerdy, but we engineers are okay with that. Engineering is the combination of many disciplines, including math, science, technology, and even art, to allow us to solve difficult problems in new and different ways. I became an in interested in engineering thanks to my dad, who was a mechanic, and encouraged me to build things and take them apart to see how they worked. When I was in junior high, I took an intro to flight class, which started a lifelong interest in all things aviation and space. By the time I got to college and landed an internship at a large aerospace company, I knew I'd found a place where I could push boundaries and make discoveries that would benefit the entire world. My engineering career has allowed me to build a diverse skill set. I've worked as a software engineer developing autopilots and automatic flight controls, where I became proficient in civil certification standards and developed my skills in high integrity systems. Then I was a systems engineer developing and testing software to find radios for advanced data links, which is like military Wi-Fi. And eventually I moved to military GPS where I got more experience with hardware and integration. Recently, I completed my master's degree in systems engineering with a focus on space systems. Some of my classes were about satellite deployment and maintenance, while others focused on human spaceflight, which has many unique challenges. We studied missions to the Moon and to Mars. But why go to Mars? Mars has captured the imagination of people for generations, and many predicted that we would have made it there by now. But what happened? How have we still not achieved this milestone? There are many reasons, not least of which is that space travel is really hard, expensive, and unforgiving. It's now been 50 years since anyone has been further away from the planet than low Earth orbit 
which isn't even halfway back to the moon. There has been a human presence in space for more than 20 years on the International Space Station, and we've done a lot of science and learned about living in space, but what's next? Whether it's determining if there was ever a thicker atmosphere on Mars, liquid water, or even microbial life, answering these questions will go a long way in understanding what's possible in the universe beyond our own experiences and help us understand what the future of our own planet may look like. Skeptics say we have plenty of problems to solve here on Earth, and they're absolutely right. But what excites me about going to Mars is that pushing boundaries forces us to innovate and those advancements help us solve difficult problems right here. Space exploration can also give us a deeper perspective on how small we really are in the universe and how unique our planet is in the scheme of things, which should unite us in preserving our own humanity. Exploration is in the fundamental nature of the human experience. We're all curious about what lies beyond our reach, and as amazing as robotic technology is, there's simply no substitute for good old-fashioned human exploration. So if we're going to put people on Mars, let's take a look at some of the biggest challenges. First, we have to contend with the distance, which is something we already deal with on robotic missions. Perseverance and ingenuity, the rover and helicopter pair that are currently on the surface of Mars, have to be controlled from Earth. Commands to Percy and Ginny are scheduled in batches which take between 5 and 20 minutes from signal to receipt, depending on the planetary geometry. Then a task can be performed, the data collected, and the same delay for the resulting data to be sent back. Another wrinkle in communications is called solar conjunction, when the sun is blocking direct line of sight between the Earth and Mars. This can interrupt communications for up to two weeks, which is inconvenient for rovers and orbiters, but is simply not acceptable when it comes to a human mission. The solution to this problem is to have a relay satellite in orbit, solar orbit either leading or trailing the Earth. This will cause an additional delay, but will be better than no communication at all during these periods. What would be beneficial to our future Martian explorers is a system to help them get around that is truly local to Mars and doesn't have to contend with this delay to provide guidance. Enter Mars GPS. Once the communication relay is in place, the next step is to deploy ground-based stations that will communicate with both future satellites and controllers on Earth. This will initially require at least four stations around the Martian equator, each with a dish antenna at least 15 meters in diameter. These stations will need a lot more automation than the current system, since there won't be any local operators, at least initially. We'll also need a lot of power to make them run. The satellites themselves will use solar panels, but since Mars is further away from the sun, dust and other factors will force us to consider other options for the ground-based transmitters. Besides, in order to get enough on power on the ground, we probably need a solar panel the size of a football field, so that's pretty much out. Our good friend Percy uses a power source called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG, which is a type of nuclear battery that converts the heat that's created by radioactive decay into safe, reliable, and constant electricity. While this type of battery is expensive and requires containment of its spent fuel, this could be our most promising option for power. So once we have the ground stations on the surface, we can deploy the satellites. It would make sense to start small with perhaps eight satellites in an orbit known as aerostationary, which is a lot like geostationary orbit around Earth, used primarily for communication satellites. In both types of orbits, the satellite matches the direction of rotation and the speed of the planet, so the satellite field of view is always the same. This orbit will have our satellites at an altitude of just over 10,000 miles. So, assuming there's enough overlap of the signals in the array, this should give us what we need for geolocation in at least two dimensions, latitude and longitude, with the exception of the extreme polar regions. Future expansion of the constellation could add coverage at the poles, as well as three dimensions by including altitude measurements. Once we have solved these challenges and get our GPS in place, we're ready to use our purpose-built receivers and start exploring. If we leverage existing GPS technologies and designs, we should be able to use a lot of components we already know how to build, which will save both time and money. 
Humans are meant to explore and push the envelope. And Mars is simply the next target in our sights. Mars GPS will help us get there and navigate to the next discoveries and beyond. As humanity grapples with its place in the universe, I hope I'll be one of the hundreds of engineers who will have a part in helping our intrepid explorers take one small step for man in the right direction on the surface of a whole new world.